Namaste. Good morning and welcome to one and all for this 13th Gutta Sri Rama Rao Memorial Lecture. Uh, now I request Pratap. Pratap. Present a bouquet to Chief Guest of the today's function, Sri Krishnan Venugopal. I request also Namrata to come and present bouquet to our Vice Chancellor. <laughs> Krishnan. Present bouquet to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Faizan Mustafa. Okay. So, now I, I request President Bouquet to uh, Choudhury, sir. Take Nal, sir. Oh, you are not informal. Okay. Okay. Now, now I request the dignitaries to lightening the lamp. I request everybody. Now I request Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Faizan Mustafa to wel give welcome address and also introduce the Chief Guest. Good morning. On behalf of uh, Nalsar University of Law, my students and uh, faculty colleagues and non-teaching staff, uh, I extend a very warm welcome to uh, Mr. Krishnan Venu Gopal, uh, who is an eminent senior advocate of Supreme Court, coming uh, from a family of very, very eminent uh, uh, legal luminaries. And Nalsar has a very close association with his uh, illustrious father, because uh, this whole Sark Law Center uh, was sponsored by him. And uh, we also have a journal in the name of uh, the Center Sark Law Nalsar uh, uh, Journal. Uh, I also extend a very warm welcome to uh, Mr. Chaudhary, uh, Sri G. K. B. Chaudhary, who is himself uh, uh, a trained lawyer, did his LLM from Columbia Law School. Uh, this uh, lecture, as you know, is in the name of uh, Shri Gutta Shri Rama Rao uh, lecture. Uh, it's the 13th uh, or 12th, it's the 13th lecture. Uh, the first lecture in 2001 was given by 
Professor Upendra Bakshi on globalization and future of human rights. Then we had a lecture by Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan on constitutional review, constitutional reforms. Next year we had a lecture by Justice Dhananjay Chandrachun on ADR and role of contemporary judge, the challenges ahead. Mr. Gopal Subramaniam gave the lecture in 2005 on use and misuse of public interest litigation. Uh, leading uh, social activist uh, Aruna Roy spoke on development relevance of Right to Information Act in 2005. Then we had former, uh, then election commissioner, I think by that time he was a former election commissioner, uh, J.M. Lindo, election reforms in India. Then we have governor of uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, speaking on national security, the challenging paradigm. We had Justice Jalmeshwar speaking in 2011 on criminal justice system. And then Justice Santosh Hegde spoke on relevance of Lokpal in contemporary India. Justice Gopal Gauda as judge of a Supreme Court delivered the 10th uh, lecture on uh, land acquisition, development and constitutional ethos. And then we had uh, leading lawyer Prashant Bhushan talking to us on use of PIL. And last year we had Justice uh, Dr. S. Murli Dhar, Judge Delhi High Court talking to us on evolution of uh, legal aid uh, movement in India. So I'll not speak about uh, Shri Guttarama Rao Ji because uh, Chaudhary Sahib will speak about it. A uh, little bit about Nalsar. Nalsar as you know now uh, is the leading in fact if we go by the latest uh, NAC rankings, uh, Nalsar is now way ahead of all other national law schools uh, uh, in the country. And we hold so many lectures now <laughs> that uh, there is a kind of a fatigue in our students in terms of uh, attending lectures. Uh, Nalsar has also to reach out to the larger community has come up with the Nalsar YouTube channel, which I would request each one of you to subscribe. We have about 400 uh, videos already uploaded uh, on our YouTube channel. So I am sure that today's lecture by yet another legal luminary, Mr. Krishnan Venu Gopal, who is a senior advocate who did his LLM from Harvard Law School, uh, has been appearing in WTO and uh, other international forums. Uh, has appeared in number of leading cases in the Supreme Court and has great academic interest because he has been an integral part of the huge project of the Supreme Court uh, of restatement of Indian law and uh, on the legislative privileges he was very closely associated he was the main contributor to that volume so sir I extend you a very warm welcome and we are really looking forward to your lecture this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, GKB Chaudhary Garu, Managing Director, Vasant Chemicals, to speak about uh, Sri Gutta Rama Rao Memorial Lecture. Good morning to all. <coughs> Chief guests uh, for today's lecture, Mr. Krishnan Venugopal, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India, Professor Paisan Mustafa, Vice Chancellor, Nalsar University, Professor Balkrishna Reddy, Registrar of Nalsar, members of faculty of Nalsar, students of Nalsar, friends and family, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have a great privilege and pleasure in introducing Sri Gutta Sarnam Rao memorial lecture <clears throat> on the subject of philosophical foundation of animal rights in India, Indian law, to being delivered by Sri Krishnan Venugopal today. As uh, Professor Mustafa mentioned, this is the 13th in this series of lectures. I can apparently see there is a fatigue in Nalsar because the student uh, attendance is very thin. Maybe we should have selected a working day. Probably they would have been happier to attend this rather than some of their classes. Maybe that's an input for the faculty and uh, management of Nalsar. Uh, Professor Mustafa has already talked about the past speakers. 
the effort of uh, the family and the trust which uh, does this lectures in collaboration with nalsar is to bring in eminent speakers from different walks of life more concerned with law practicing lawyers judges past and present or ngos and social activists who can enlighten us on different aspects of law all of us are aware that in a democracy or any society rule of law is very important for a humane and peaceful existence of everybody including animals today's topic on philosophy of or philosophical background of animal rights in indian law is a very important and current topic because uh, one can argue that you know india is still grappling with the issue of human rights where is the time and need for animal rights but that's not true because ever since the history and evolution of human kind even in the days of hunters and gatherers there was a section of society or so called liberals who always worked hard for the animal rights and they always believed in coexistence of all creatures in the nature and the society and nature has ensured from times immemorial that you know coexistence is the only way to progress so it is incumbent upon all of us to make sure that animals and other creatures are also protected and treated with compassion and love today's lecture is uh, will help us to understand the present scenario with regard to the law you know that right from indian penal code of 1860 to the prevention of cruelty to animals act in 1960 about 100 years and thereafter and in the recent past there are several legislations which are uh, legislated by the parliament and state legislatures to protect the rights of animals domestic animals wild animals nature and environment some of them are yet to be implemented in true spirit but it's going on and it's a ongoing process and work in progress so therefore this lecture will enlighten us the way forward and uh, as uh, the humane society uh, members inform me sri krishnan venugopalan venugopal has been very active and has been supporting this cause of animal rights in the supreme court and various high courts and uh, most of the cases he takes up pro bono which is very encouraging and which is very uh, very very a great uh, job and uh, i have had the privilege of my father mr g s ramarao and uh, his grandfather mr venugopal's grandfather mr nambiar were contemporaries in the madras law college in the late or early 90s i would say 19th uh, 1930 36 that area time and i have had the privilege of uh, working or maybe being a client to his father mr k k venugopal on three occasions when we approached the supreme court for some relief and uh, obviously we can expect a very very good speech and enlightening speech from him today just to give you my the lectures background my father was a lawyer in uh, elur he came to practice in 1939 and practiced for 55 years before he eventually retired from the supreme court of india in 1984 and uh, he was a uh, very uh, prominent uh, criminal lawyer in uh, elur where uh, in west godavari district then went on to practice in supreme court for more than 22 years and with our we to contribute our bit towards the legal enlightenment and legal studies we uh, our family has instituted this gutta sri ramaro lecture which was an endowment lecture till 2006 and after the demise of a father it became a memorial lecture my father was a very committed and uh, person towards education and held a very strong view and belief that only education and hard work are the two mantras which can take india forward and that's exactly why we are in involved in this apart from any other educational institutions in elur and other places we would like to by instituting this memorial lecture at nalsar we are able to call upon eminent speakers to from various walks of life to share their views so that the not only the students of nalsar but the citizens of hyderabad also get benefited of a different of view, view. i am very grateful uh, sir to mr venugopal for delivering the 13th uh, memor gutta sri ramaro lecture which is relevant and useful topic i thank all of you having for having taken your valuable time to come here it's a long distance and i thank uh, the management of nalsar for having given me this opportunity i will not stand between you and mr venugopal any longer thank you very much thank you sir 
now i request krishnan ven gopal to deliver the memorial lecture vice chancellor professor mustafa <coughs> mr chaudhry professor balkis reddy professors of nalsar and uh, students i recognize some familiar faces here including mr jaisimma who is uh, a former member of the animal rights board and somebody i have worked with uh, frequently on animal rights cases so i must tell you that whatever i say today is drawn at least in some part from the learning that i have acquired from uh, mr jaisimma mr mihir samson ms gauri moleki and others who are involved in the animal rights movement in india i have come to the animal rights movement a little late in my career i started appearing for uh, ms moleki in uh, the national green tribunal where we crafted a strategy based on upholding environmental norms to alleviate the suffering of mules and equines involved in the vaishno devi uh, carriage of pilgrims and supplies to the shrine i deferred to their view that in all likelihood they would not be able to succeed in getting relief from a writ court as you know the animal uh, rights movement does suffer from a serious problem of lack of understanding and empathy uh, with animals we therefore decided that we would focus heavily on the environmental degradation caused by using thousands of mules uh, horses donkeys etc in carrying pilgrims and supplies up from uh, the base katra to the shrine some 20 tons of dung at the time were being generated per day were being generated per day which the shrine board was simply unable to deal with although they pretended that uh, their uh, plant the waste disposal plant that they had was capable of dealing with this kind of uh, dung the matter is now in the supreme court we'll have to wait and see how it all pans out suffice it to say that the current situation is they're going to reduce the number of equines from some 6 or 7000 to about 2500 over a course of 10 years which we believe is not good enough and therefore we are trying to uh, get that report rejected by the supreme court how successful we will be time will only tell the other case i was involved in involved the problem of stray dogs which were being killed in kerala in large numbers because of problems encountered by uh, people in the vicinity of municipal uh, uh, garbage dumps we come therefore to the first and biggest problem that most people don't understand in the context of animal rights today in the ordinary human condition where we live in urban settings we encounter problems with animals because of the problems that we have created just as you have deer in the forests or on the plains that multiply when there is abundant grass and foliage on account of rains if human beings generate large quantities of animal waste that are not disposed of you're bound to see a multiplication in the animals that feed off that waste like stray dogs so we create the problem and then instead of dealing with them humanely 
as is possible under the current animal birth control rules specifically made for dogs under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, we start campaigns in which people say that they're going to slaughter dogs in large numbers regardless of whether they're responsible for any actual harm to a human being. The next case that I came to be involved in tangentially uh, initially and now more fully is the Jalikatu matter after the Supreme Court had ruled in favor of the animal rights activists who said that bulls should not be subjected to Jalikatu in Tamil Nadu and that the act, the Tamil Nadu Regulation of Jalikatu Act was repugnant to the Prevention of Cruelty Act. As you know, after that great success, vote bank politics resulted in the government resiling from its earlier position that bulls are not performing animals. And they basically allowed the Tamil Nadu government to come in with a law that they said they would assent to under Article 254 of the Constitution. There are constitutional challenges currently pending in the Supreme Court to that act as well on the ground that culture and tradition uh, cannot really trump uh, fundamental rights. We'll have to see how that uh, matter pans out as well. So these cases give you some idea of the problems in the man-animal interface in modern India. But the most shocking one is one that I came across quite recently when I was asked to appear in the chickens for battery cages case. Most of us do not realize that non-vegetarianism in India is premised on large-scale factory farming of chickens where the activists say some 400 million chickens are raised in battery cages only for egg laying. How many are uh, in battery cages for broilers? I don't even know. But the numbers would seem to suggest that it is in the many hundreds of millions all told in India because uh, the government and society would like to encourage uh, the eating of protein by India's uh, masses. The problem there is that the conditions in which the chickens are raised are abysmal. They get, as activists are, are fond of pointing out, less than an A4 sheet sized paper worth of space where they cannot stand to their full height. They cannot flap their wings. They don't have the facilities to forage for food, uh, that is to peck away they don't have an outlet for nesting. These are all basic characteristics of a chicken, which means that we are basically keeping these chickens in conditions that prevent them from exercising their most natural human instincts. This is, of course, without reference to the fact that we have made them through a process of trait selection chickens that will lay eggs every day instead of every three or four days as they used to. I guess the big point that I'm trying to make is that humans are altering the nature of the animal kingdom in order to suit themselves across vast swaths of that kingdom, at least insofar as the domesticated animals and birds are concerned. Many of you must be familiar with the work of uh, Yuval Harari Noah and his book called Homo, Homo Sapiens. And when you read that book, what you realize is we are just another animal as part of the overall animal kingdom that happened by chance or otherwise to turn in a direction where we, were, where we were able to develop our cognition and our ability to reason 
to a level where we could alter nature to suit ourselves. I do not think that a million years ago it was ever anticipated that we would have the kind of large-scale colonization of the earth in the form of cities where megapolises, megalopolises, where millions and millions of people live. And what we would need to do in order to make the earth suitable for us to function in these large-scale uh, human settings. It is in that light that I would now like to deal with the question of animal rights. Before we turn to animal rights, we must acknowledge that all notions of the relationship between animals and human beings originate in religion. And here we can contrast two differing views of the world between the Eastern religions, especially those born in India, like Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and Sikhism, and the Judeo-Christian religions and Islam, which were born in the Middle East. The fundamental point which I would like to make is that if you read the Bible, which I think is the origin of most laws in Europe from where we derive our own laws, and when I say Europe I really mean England because you know that our colonial history did involve only Britain. Let me read a short verse from the book of Genesis from the King James Version of the Bible. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. This is verse 26 of chapter 1. Verse 28 goes on to say, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. two basic points that emerge from this. The first is that when the Bible says God sa said that I will make man in my image, in effect man is, is setting himself up as being in God's image or rather to put it in reverse God is made in our minds, in our image. That's the notion of anthropomorphism. The second fundamental idea which you can draw from this is that in the Judeo-Christian ethic the earth is given to man to subdue along with all the creatures that live upon the earth. Which is why as man starts to gain a better understanding of the principles the scientific principles that govern the earth, you start seeing him try to turn the earth, to twist it, to manipulate it, so that he can dominate it and all the creatures that live upon it. Contrast that, however, with the Hindu view of the world. Of course, the early uh, texts, like the Rig Veda, talk about animal sacrifice combined with veneration of animals. In that there is a hierarchy. Man sacrifices animals to God so that he would be blessed by the gods. The animals are subordinate to man and of course to gods and the plants below the animals. But by the Upanishads you have a wholly different approach 
where it asks you to view man as being one species in a continuum that includes animals and plants. Brahman or the oneness of the universal God is in all of us, in animals, in plants and even in inanimate things. And this gives us a more environmentalistic ethic than that afforded by the Judeo-Christian approach. And of course, in the Upanishads and subsequently, you have three fundamental notions of karma, of rebirth and ahimsa, which are all connected fundamentally. Karma is the notion that he who does good becomes good and he who does evil becomes evil. And if you do evil, you are reborn potentially as a lower life form than man. There is a hierarchy here, but the effect is that your relatives in a past life, your husbands, your wives, your children, your uh, uncles, your brothers, may be in the animals and in the insects that live alongside you. And therefore, I remember from my own childhood that as little children, when you have very little idea of right and wrong, if you did harm to any living thing, and it could include any uh, insect that crawled into your house, your parents or your grandparents would instruct you that to do harm to any living thing was bad because it would affect you and your karma, presumably, in a future life. The reverence for all living things, therefore, is inculcated or was inculcated in us by virtue of these religious concepts. You find those concepts carried forward and strengthened even more in Buddhism and Jainism. So in these great Indian religions, you have the fundamental notions for a very different ethic in terms of how you treat animals as well as the environment around you. But coming back to the law and how it developed within the Judeo-Christian system, all of you must have heard of the great Catholic philosopher Thomas uh, Aquinas. Aquinas firmly believed in the hierarchy of man being ascendant over animals and animals over plants. In his ethic, the only reason that man should be kind and compassionate to animals was that if you did not, you would be cruel to humans as well. And there was no doubt, absolutely no doubt, that in accordance with the views of the, uh, in the Bible, that animals were meant for our use in whatever manner we chose to use them. The fundamental notion, therefore, that underpins all notions of the law up to the 20th century, therefore, in Britain at least, was that animals are property. And this is probably true of Europe as well, though many of those European countries have now tried to alter their constitutions or pass laws to respect animals and their dignity. Germany, Switzerland, and so on. But coming back to England, in the common law, animals were fundamentally property. If you were cruel to animals within the confines of your own home, the, the law did not in any way forbid you from doing so. There was no criminal or civil law consequence to it. There were some common law offenses if you harmed or injured another man's property, whether you call it common nuisance, public nuisance, or even malicious injury to property. But what you did in private was not an offense at all. 
By the late 18th century, however, you have the philosopher, the utilitarian philosopher Jeremy Bentham, unleashing that credo which still motivates the animal rights movement. He said, the question is not, can animals talk, nor can animals reason, but whether animals can suffer. And it is that idea, even though it was given to us by a utilitarian philosopher for whom everything could be traded, anything and everything could be traded for the greater good, it is a utilitarian who gave us this notion that animals can suffer. And that was the underpinning of the attempt by Lord Erskine in 1809 to move a law, I mean to get a bill passed in the House of Lords and thereafter in the House of Commons, in which the philosophy was that man should not be cruel to animals even if they were given to him for his use and for his comfort. This was based on benevolence and compassion for animals. While the bill was passed in the House of Lords, in the House of Commons, it is said that William Wyndham managed to turn the debate towards the question of whether man had dominion over animals in the Bible, and the bill was not passed in the House of Commons. Thereafter, in 1822, you have Martin's Law, a very limited law confined to ill treatment of cattle and uh, horses and geldings, but the law was called a bill to prevent the ill treatment of cattle. That law did come to be passed. And in that you have the seeds of our 1890 Act, which said that at least in public, in certain limited notified local areas, you could not commit cruelty on animals. It was confined, I believe, to domestic or captured animals, but the law was very limited in its scope. Thereafter, in 1953, Rukmini Devi Arundel brought a private member's bill for the prevention of cruelty to animals. She gave an impassioned speech in which she invokes many of the philosophical concepts and ideas that still underpin today's uh, movement, animal rights movement. She talked of how we have created concentration camps for animals, of how non-vegetarianism involved a huge waste of resources and therefore was bad for the environment, how the land could support far more people if you only had ate grain and vegetables instead of animals and so on. The main opposition came from those who said that if you are unable to prevent cruelty to human beings and if you can't guarantee them sufficient food and thirst, if you can't prevent people from being cruel to other human beings, then what is the need for such a law? It doesn't really fit within the framework of the India of the 1950s. That private member's bill, which was limited in its scope, came to be referred to a committee, a larger committee, at the instance of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, who agreed that there was a need for an act. But he said it had to be considered in all its dimensions in uh, the India of the 1950s, and that he thought that he could not agree with some of the concepts that Rukmini Devi Arundel had espoused. That committee report was again referred to another joint committee of the Houses of Parliament, which ultimately resulted in the Prevention of Cruelty Act, 1960. I will now try to sketch in very broad brush strokes 
the scheme of that act. I'm more concerned about the philosophy underlying that act than the specific provisions. Very broadly, Section 3 of that act, according to the Supreme Court, gives rights to animals while simultaneously imposing duties. Section 3 imposes a positive duty to take reasonable means for the well-being of animals and also in the second half talks of preventing the infliction of unnecessary pain or suffering on animals. That is the right conferred on animals. Section 11 explains that second part of Section 3 by enumerating a number of different ways in which you can inflict cruelty on animals. But the interesting aspect of it is that it talks of punishing owners which includes in the definition clause those who happen to be in possession of the animal. But from this you clearly get an idea that animals are still considered property. In the modern world, unfortunately, at least in the Indian context, it is very difficult to create or construct a legal framework that does not involve property rights in animals. Whether it is a pet in your home, whether it is an animal that is used to carry uh, or transport goods or people, whether it is animals in a factory farm like chickens, they are all subject to the ownership of property rights of somebody. And that problem is not going to go away in the near future. Section, uh, let me not talk of a section. Chapter 2 is a very important chapter which creates the Animal Welfare Board of India, which has a number of positive duties apart from interfering in cases where they found that animals were being treated cruelly. Uh, they are supposed to advise the government on framing of rules. They have the power to make their own regulations. They are supposed to promote welfare generally. They are supposed to educate people about animal rights and animal welfare. Chapter 4 deals with the performance of experiments on animals. Again, there is a system of uh, regulation where a committee is set up to make rules and to ensure that experiments do not cause unnecessary pain or suffering before or after or during experiments. There is also a chapter on performing animals. And here, again, the concept is of regulation. The most important provision, because the criminal offense is under section 11 are relatively painless. The fines are extremely small and in the alternative to three months of imprisonment. Section 29 is important because it gives the court the power to deprive owners convicted of an offense under the act of their ownership of the animal. And this represents the only teeth in the act as far as cruelty to animals go. There is also a provision that permits the court to prohibit a person who is convicted of offenses 
of having custody of any animal. Now this could be an even more important provision from the standpoint of regulation of cruelty or, or prevention of cruelty to animals. By the 19, early 1970s, with the intervention of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, you also have the Protection of Wildlife Act. Basically, what it does is it gives the government power to create sanctuaries and to create what I would call in uh, jurisprudential terms a public trust in relation to wild animals and the ability to wall them off from human activity. This I think represents the environmental philosophy or an environmentalist ethic in our attitudes towards animals. Against this background, I would now like to discuss the most recent judgment of the Supreme Court that purports to confer rights on animals, which is the A. Nagara judgment of 2014 by Justice Radhakrishnan and Justice Pinaki Ghosh. That judgment, of course, is in the context of the conflict between the, uh, uh, the Tamil Nadu Regulation of Jalikatu Act and the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. Justice Radhakrishnan follows two earlier judgments of his in the context of protection of wildlife, which is the Asiatic buffalo and the relocation of lions, and talks about how we need to shift from an anthropocentric view of animals to an ecocentric view of the world. He says that animal welfare is an important part of our ethos and that we should ensure that animals are protected. In a somewhat controversial paragraph in his judgment, he says that animals, or he suggests that animals may even have rights under Article 21. On a very careful reading of that paragraph, however, I would beg to differ. There is a number of uh, reasons why I think that he did not really intend to confer rights on animals directly. What he said was, that the right to life of human beings under Article 21 had been expanded to include protection against disturbances to the environment. The environment, he says, includes animals. And then he makes a leap to how the life of an animal is not just survival and existence, but survival with some dignity. Based on this, many animal rights activists have concluded that animals have Article 21 rights. I do not think so. I think at best it can be read as a vindication of a human being's right, a person's right, to claim certain minimum conditions or freedoms on behalf of animals. And that becomes clear from the fact that in his conclusions, he relies mainly on Article 51, capital A, G, and H, and not on directly conferring rights on them under Article 21. 51 A, G, as you may recall, apart from requiring us to respect and protect our environment generally, including rivers, lakes, mountains, etc., also talks of compassion for all living creatures. And that is really a duty on the part of human beings. He also talks of five human freedoms, uh, five animal freedoms, which he draws, he says, from the international instruments concerning animal rights. 
though he acknowledges in an earlier part of the judgment that these have never been converted into an instrument actually ratified by uh, the countries of the world. He says that India supports the OIE, which is an international organization for animal uh, welfare, I believe under the auspices of the UN. And he say, from that, he says that the Universal Declaration for Animal Welfare and its five freedoms ought to be read into sections of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, including section 3 and section 11. My own conclusion from the judgment is that rather than speaking of rights having been conferred on animals under the judgment, it is probably fair to read it more as an expansion of our duties of compassion and benevolence and trying to enforce more strictly the provisions of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, especially in that case, Section 111A and Section 111M. The first concerns not beating, kicking, overdriving, overriding, torturing, or otherwise treating an animal in any way uh, with unnecessary cruelty or pain and suffering. The second, I believe, relates to obligations with respect to performing animals. As you know, the judgment relies in large part on the fact that the MOEF's initial approach of classifying bulls as not being performing animals was being violated by the Jalikattu Act. He talks about the cruelty, the enormous cruelty inflicted on bulls in the course of making them run. He points out that their anatomy is not designed for running and trying to flee from human beings who want to tame them. And that bulls are driven into a frenzy before they are uh, tamed, including by pouring uh, alcohol down their throats, by biting and breaking their tails, by uh, torturing them in other unimaginable ways. And he says all of this amounts to sadism. Uh, which the learned judge found himself unable to tolerate, as most thinking human beings would. In that background, I'd like to discuss some philosophical theories on how we can confer rights on animals. There is a philosopher, Peter Singer, who has developed a utilitarian model of interests of animals in contrast to the earlier utilitarians like Bentham and John Stuart Mill, who was after all a rule utilitarian, he talks of the consequences of acts, which I guess makes him an act utilitarian. He says that he would prefer to go by preferences and interests of animals. And in that, he says, he would like to see them as having interests which should not be traded off against human interests. Of course, the problem with all utilitarians is that it comes down ultimately to the greatest good of the greatest number. And in his scheme, as some critics have pointed out, even a non-consenting human adult could be the subject of experiments if it would actually lead to large-scale benefits for other human beings. So certainly, animals could be traded off under certain circumstances if you could demonstrate that the benefits that accrued are much greater than the harm suffered by the animal. As against that, you have deontological rights theorists like Tom uh, Reagan, who believe that animals should have rights 
and that under no circumstances should they be subjected to human interests. You cannot hunt, trap, eat animals for food, experiment them on them, or kill them for your clothing. The problem with Tom Reagan's philosophy is not so much one of inconsistency, but one of practicability in the modern world when large numbers of people are still non-vegetarians. Large numbers of people on a daily basis do use leather for their clothes, for their belts, for their shoes. Then you have theories of justice like that of Martha Nussbaum which try to build a consistent theory on the justice that is owed to animals based on their capabilities. The problem here again is that her theory breaks down when she tries to reconcile her theory of justice with, with the problem of animals as food, animals for experiments, etc., which she would tolerate. So broadly, these are the three philosophies that you have. I must mention also that in international jurisprudence, you have um, cases involving attempts to claim personhood for animals in the uh, form of uh, the great apes, whales, and so on. Cetaceans, I should say. On a side note, our own uh, Ministry of Environment came out with an interesting circular uh, notification where they said that cetaceans are legal persons and ought not to be kept in what they call dolphinariums. Uh, to be used for dolphin shows and so on. So the notion of legal personhood is creeping into our law as well. But in the United States, there is this uh, lawyer, scholar, Stephen Weiss, who is running this project called the Non-Human non Rights Project, where he has tried repeatedly to get uh, the notion of personhood entrenched in American state law at least, for animals such as chimpanzees and so on. After initial success, he has not so far been able to get a judgment from any court which recognizes standing, even as an ex-friend, on the part of uh, animals to sue for their rights. In Argentina, however, I believe there is one case where they did recognize uh, an animal as a person. In India, however, there are some interesting judgments from Justice Rajiv Sharma earlier of the Himachal High Court who is now in the Uttarakhand High Court. In Uttarakhand, he actually delivered a judgment which prohibited all forms of animal sacrifice during Hindu religious festivals in temples where he ruled that this was not an essential religious practice in Hinduism after studying various religious texts. That judgment went up to the Supreme Court and an interim order was passed which effectively made it impossible for uh, religious uh, animal sacrifices to be made in Himachal by saying that you would have to observe municipal uh, and uh, other laws, including the slaughterhouse rules. Um, I, was, uh, I was involved in that uh, case as well, where that interim order was passed. And in effect, all animal sacrifice in uh, Himachal has stopped, is what I was told. In Uttarakhand, he has passed a judgment in a case involving horses that pull Tongas into Nepal, where he has conferred full-scale personhood on all animals, at least in the state of Uttarakhand. 
he has cited from various scholarly articles on personhood where the two basic points which are made are as follows. The first is that personhood is really a legal fiction where personhood has been conferred, for example, on corporations as artificial legal entities. There is no reason, therefore, why you cannot confer personhood on animals as well. To put it uh, a little differently, until the 13th Amendment in the United States, slaves were property. A whole race of human beings was property until the 13th Amendment came in. And after the 13th Amendment came in, nobody doubted that slaves were persons and human beings who were entitled to full-scale rights. The second conception, the second uh, reason that he gave, uh, based on the scholarly articles, was that it was not necessary that corresponding duties be ascribed to the person, in this case an animal, who claims rights. The traditional objection is that normally a person who can be the bearer of rights, the subject of rights, also has to be able to discharge the corresponding duty to the person at the other end uh, who bears the corresponding duty. The second aspect of this is that he should also be able to vindicate his own rights. But if you look at babies, infants, severely retarded human beings, they aren't capable of uh, vindicating their own rights. They're not capable of discharging duties. You nevertheless see them as persons and it would be abhorrent to our way of thinking to allow experiments to be performed on them because they, whether they're in a coma, whether they're retarded, whether they're infants or otherwise, which means that it is because they are humans that we accord to them these rights to bodily integrity, to not being harmed, etc. By the same token, animals which are definitely the subjects of a life, as Tom Reagan puts it, can also be given rights by the same token. It is not that I expect a tiger not to eat me. It is that because of my superior force, because of the technology that I wield, I should not be allowed to harm the tiger. And as a next friend, anyone can espouse the cause of that tiger or for that matter any animal that roams on our streets. Personhood, therefore, as a legal concept, is probably something that is achievable. The only constraints on that are twofold. The first is the idea that rights must be absolute. However, my own way of looking at it is that there is no reason if you can confer rights on a corporation that are limited to Article 14 under our Constitution, why it should not be possible to confer limited rights on an animal that correspond to what it needs to be able to exercise the choices that it is capable of making. And the second major objection is that constraints on those choices there, there can't be constraints on those rights, is the second major philosophical objection. To which I say anybody who reads articles 19.2 through 6 would know that there are constraints on every right, every fundamental freedom exercised by a human being as well. There is no reason why you cannot delineate carefully the contours of that right even within the notion that human beings will have certain overriding rights in respect of animals. In many ways, if you look at the careful manner in which the uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act has been drafted, it is possible to have degrees, it is possible through the exercise of discretion 
to draw lines carefully that would permit us to confer rights on animals by giving them legal personhood. It is the will that is wanting, mainly because in today's context, the vast majority of people are not willing to accord such rights to animals when they believe that human beings are in equally, if not greater, conditions of suffering. So this may have to wait. I'd like to end by pointing out that in all our strategies for vindicating animal rights, ultimately we have to depend on positive law. And this positive law that we depend upon need not be solely the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. In every case in which I'm involved, we have to make arguments as to how human beings are adversely affected by cruelty to animals. Sometimes we talk of the environment, which is a fundamental right under Article 21 for human beings, as in the Vaishno Devi case. Sometimes, as in the case of chickens in battery cages, we talk of the problems for human beings created by indiscriminate use of antibiotics necessary to keep them in those cages, the problems of new zoonotic diseases that may spread from chickens to humans, and so on. This, unfortunately, is going to continue to be the way in which we will try to vindicate the rights of animals in the near future in India. But I'd like to end on a note of hope and optimism. More and more, I see that ordinary people, including law students, lawyers, and activists outside, are developing a certain empathy towards the plight of animals. We put ourselves in their shoes and we realize the pain emotionally and the suffering physically that animals undergo to serve our needs. That, I think, is the greatest hope for the future. In this regard, I'd like to tell you only one notion that struck me in the context of the way that animals are made to suffer today. Supposing there were an intelligent civilization, an alien civilization that came from space and colonized the earth and converted human beings into objects, things, property that they could utilize for their own goals. Supposing humans were farmed, they were made to procreate, to supply food for this civilization. Supposing experiments could be performed on human beings. Suppose that human beings were made to s become slaves to entertain and so on. Would we then buy into an argument that because our cognition and our reasoning was limited in comparison to the superior civilization, alien civilization, that therefore we had no rights in relation to that civilization. That in many ways, it seems to me, summarizes the idea, the attitude that we need to inculcate in our people today and in future gener generations through education. The optimism stems from the fact that there has been a flurry of successful initiatives over the past decade and a half, maybe two decades, where animals have been freed from the kind of cruel treatment that they have been undergoing without any question or sensitivity in the past. 
And with that, I would like to end my talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for elaborating and thought-provoking uh, lecture. Now I request Nivedita Chaudhary to present a moment to Mr. Krishnan. Thank you, sir. I would like to propose a word of thanks. Of course, we are thankful to Sri uh, uh, Krishnan Venugopal. In spite of his busy schedule, he is here with us and he delivered a wonderful lecture. Actually, we all have to take note and you know start uh, thinking about how to protect animal rights. So he himself sharing his uh, valuable experience with us. Thank you, sir, uh, being with us and uh, delivering the lecture. I also thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor and uh, Chaudhary Garu and his family, particularly all um, Vasant Group of Chemicals, uh, uh, they, they are here. Today, sorry sir, because of some intra moot court competitions are uh, happening, so uh, we didn't have much my Nalsar students, but thank you, you are all came all the way and uh, participating in this thing. I thank all the media and uh, other friends also, thank you. And uh, now I request everybody to stand up for national anthem. Punjab Singh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Utkala Vanga Vindra Himachala Yamuna Ganga Utchala Jaladhita Ranga Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Ashish Mage Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha जनगण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 जय